Hello and welcome to our presentation on endotracheal intubation. Assessment and maintenance of a patent airway is probably one of the most critical skills provided by an emergency medical technician at any level, from the EMR up to the paramedic. This presentation will focus on the equipment and skill necessary to perform endotracheal intubation. Preparation for advanced airway management starts long before the call even comes in. Think to yourself, what equipment do you believe would be necessary to facilitate successful airway management in a critically ill or injured patient? Do you know where all of that equipment is located on the ambulance which you are assigned? Are you familiar with how to use the equipment which you are assigned? And is that equipment in good working order and within manufacturer expiration dates? Like I said in a previous slide, the first step in successful airway management starts long before the tones even sound. Providers at all levels must know the location of all equipment under their control and check that equipment to make sure it is in good working order and within manufacturer safe for use dates. So let's think of some of the equipment we may need. Let's start with personal protective equipment, face shields, gloves, goggles, glasses, gowns, head covers, and masks all keep us safe while performing these skills. The actual equipment that we would use to facilitate airway management include the capnography sampling devices, a stethoscope, bougie introducer, endotracheal tubes in assorted sizes prescribed by the Department of Health, 10 milliliter syringe, malleable stylets, lubrication, laryngoscope handles, and blades including Mac and Miller blades, a securing device, batteries, spare batteries, and a secondary airway device. Other equipment that some providers may not think of when we're considering advanced airway management is suction, rigid tubing, and soft tubing, a suction container, and a spare overflow container, connective tubing. Is the suction functional? Is it functional at the appropriate PSI? irrigation fluid in case our suction tubing becomes clogged, portable suction, spare portable suction power, including maybe an extension cord, spare portable suction containers, oral nasogastric tubes, and a 60 milliliter syringe with the catheter tip to facilitate OG and NG2 placement. All providers must take the time to become familiar with the specific equipment utilized on the ambulance in which they are assigned. This is a standard endotracheal intubation kit. There are two sets of blades. There is a straight blade and a curved blade. The Miller blade is a straight blade, and if you have trouble remembering that, the two L's in Miller may remind you that the blade is straight and shaped like lowercase l's, where the Macintosh blade are curved similar to the C in Macintosh. Both sets of blades store the bulb at the end of the blade. Providers need to make sure that that bulb is screwed in tightly so it doesn't fall out, and the coloration is bright and white, so to illuminate the posterior pharynx appropriately. There is a set of handles, one with a larger diameter, which is commonly accepted for use in the adult patient, and one with a smaller diameter that is commonly accepted for use in the pediatric population. Each of these usually have a screw bottom or a screw top as to access the batteries within. Batteries should be checked to make sure they are clean and void of any sort of contamination or corrosion. If you are using a non-disposable system, all blades and components need to be cleaned. You need to make sure there is no dirt or any foreign material on any of these blades, as we will be introducing these into somebody's pharynx. This is a fiber optic endotracheal intubation kit. It is distinguished from a non-fiber optic endotracheal kit by a green band around each of the handles. Also, the plastic aperture at the base of each blade is usually colored in green. 
The primary difference between the fiber optic and non-fiber optic kit is the fiber optic kit has the bulb at the top of the handle. It is secured with a plastic aperture. Once the blade is attached to the handle, the light from the bulb at the top of the handle runs along a track in the blade and illuminates the posterior fairings. It is very important that you do not mix components between a non-fiber optic system and a fiber optic system because the components are not interchangeable. A fiber optic blade system will not work in a non-fiber optic system. Some departments utilize visualization devices that are electronic, such as the GlideScope or the King Vision. All providers should become proficient in the use of these devices and practice with them often. This is a standard endotracheal tube. To the right of the screen, you're gonna notice a 15 millimeter adapter, and that's a standard diameter for most airway devices. That accepts a bag valve mask or devices such as co-oximetry sampling device. There is an inflatable pilot balloon that is blue in this particular endotracheal tube. This has a lure lock adapter set that accepts a lure lock style syringe. As you insert the syringe, you push and twist, then you can inflate or deflate the distal balloon. When checking and when applying air during intubation to this cuff, you should remove the syringe from this pilot. The tail end of that pilot needs to be assessed to make sure there's no leaking prior to insertion of the tube into the patient. And if you leave the syringe attached, that can allow air to come back into the syringe and deflate the distal tube inadvertently. There are depth markings upon the tube and as the tube is inserted in the trachea, these are the markings that end up at the lip line. Providers need to be vigilant and watch these markings to make sure there is not an increase or decrease in the number or the depth, and that may indicate dislodgement from the trachea during treatment or transport. There is a line around the end of the distal end of the tube. It's usually black. It is a radiological confirmation band that shows up in x-ray. There are sometimes long stripes on each endotracheal tube that will also confirm the proper anatomical placement of the device during imagery. At the tail end of the balloon, just past the inflatable cuff, there is a hole in the endotracheal tube. This is called the Murphy's eye, and nothing should go past that, especially a malleable stylet, because you don't want to cause damage to the trachea during insertion. And the inflatable cuff is 10 milliliters uh, when it's inflated properly. You should not inflate this cuff more than 10 milliliters as this may cause damage to the cartilaginous rings of the trachea. This is an example of several cuffed endotracheal tubes. Rhode Island Department of Health regulation requires that all advanced life support ambulances carry sizes between 2.5 millimeters and 8 millimeters internal diameter of cuff tubes. The pediatric population has certain considerations with endotracheal intubation. You may use the following formula, the aging years divided by four plus three, or you may use a standardized tape or other calculation system such as the hand heavy system to determine the appropriately sized endotracheal tube for your patient. Generally, Adults will take between a 7.0 and an 8 endotracheal tube. You should visualize the patient's nares, and as you enter the patient's posterior pharynx with the laryngoscope, make a determination if that particular tube is too big or too small. Endotracheal tubes of all sizes have appropriately sized Malleable stylets, and malleable is not only fun to say, but it means that you're able to manipulate it and bend it without breaking. Some endotracheal tubes come preloaded with malleable stylets. We need to remember that when we insert these devices, we don't want to go past the Murphy's eye. Once you've reached the appropriate depth that you 
select to have inside of the tube to facilitate intubation. You should bend the top over the top of the tube to make sure that device does not go deeper than you'd like it to go into the trachea during intubation. The Bougie tube introducer is a device that requires great skill and patience to use. The tip of this device is curved, and that's intentional. As the provider inserts this device into the posterior pharynx and hopefully the trachea, the provider will notice a clicking or a vibration along the interior diameter of the trachea caused by the cartilaginous rings, which is unique to that structure. If it's in the esophagus, the provider won't notice that vibration or clicking as the esophagus is a smooth walled uh, anatomical structure. Once this device is in the trachea, the endotracheal tube can be slid over the device and into place and confirmation devices can be used to ensure proper placement of the endotracheal tube. This device can be preloaded. However, providers need to understand that the endotracheal tube is entering into a sterile environment and care should be taken not to contaminate the end of the endotracheal tube. This device can also be used for retrograde intubation where a surgical uh, hole is made in the neck at the cricothyroid uh, area and comes through the mouth and the tube is then inserted over into the trachea. There are several different styles of coaximetry devices available in healthcare. Rhode Island EMS predominantly uses three different styles. The first is an inline sampling device. It is a small tube with a 15 millimeter adapter on either side. This fits on an endotracheal tube or a biot on one side and completes the circuit terminally at a bag valve mask or other device such as a ventilated circuit on the other side. The second type is a nasal cannula and tidal CO2 sampling device. Some of these devices have a port so the provider can administer oxygen to the patient while they're sampling the end tidal CO2 at the same time. Many of these come with a small plastic scoop at the end of the nasal cannula portion or a small tube to receive expelled air from the patient for sampling. Some of them have a beefy section at the nasal cannula with small holes to receive expelled air for sampling. The third style is a colorimetric device. This device has paper which will change color, usually a shade of gold, when it is exposed to expelled carbon dioxide. One of the pitfalls of this device is it will only change once. So once it is exposed to expel carbon dioxide, it will not change back and forth if that tube has been removed from the patient's trachea. Therefore, Rhode Island EMS does condone the use of this device for initial assessment only after six to eight breaths once the patient is intubated. After that, you must use a waveform and quantitative device such as the inline sampling device to continuously monitor your patient while they're intubated. There are several commercial devices utilized to secure the endotracheal tube, some such as the Lairdell Thomas securing device secures the tube towards the center of the mouth, as does the Hollister anchor device. In others, you'll be securing the tube to the left side of the mouth, such as using endotracheal ribbon or even oxygen tubing in a pinch. These come in adult and pediatric sizes and providers should be aware and familiar with the devices that are utilized by the systems they represent. When providing advanced airway procedures on any patient, providers should have a backup device prepared in the event direct visualization of the cords is unsuccessful. This could be an LMA, King tube, or the ITL. EMS providers provide skills in unpredictable and unforgiving environments. The skill of endotracheal intubation is not applied in EMS as a sterile skill. However, providers should maintain aseptic technique during this procedure.
Endotracheal tubes arrive from the manufacturer in sterile packaging. Keep the majority of the endotracheal tube in the packaging until you are ready to insert it into the patient's trachea. Do not take the tube out of its sterile packaging and place it on a counter, bench, ground, or patient's chest prior to insertion. It is important to remember that you do not need to completely remove the endotracheal tube from the manufacturer's packaging to complete these steps. Peel back approximately two inches from the seal packaging to expose the pilot balloon and the 15 millimeter adapter to perform the following. Insert the stylet into the endotracheal tube via the adapter at the top. The tip of the stylet should not bypass Murphy's eye. Mold the end of the endotracheal tube with the stylet within it in the shape of a hockey stick. Mold the top of the stylet over the endotracheal tube so it does not advance into the trachea upon insertion. It is imperative that you check the integrity of the cuff and pilot balloon while maintaining the integrity and sterility of the endotracheal tube as much as possible. So do not completely remove the endotracheal tube from the manufacturer's packaging to complete these steps. Instead, peel back approximately two inches from the sealed packaging to expose the pilot balloon and perform the following. Connect a 10 milliliter syringe with a lure lock adapter to the pilot with a push and clockwise twist motion. Inflate the pilot with 10 milliliters of air. Remove the 10 milliliter syringe from the pilot in a counterclockwise motion. Check the integrity of the pilot confirming no air is escaping from the lower lock or the pilot balloon. Check the integrity of the distal cuff and make sure no air is escaping from a hole in the balloon. Reattach the 10 milliliter syringe to the pilot and draw the syringe back to 10 milliliters, deflating the balloon and pilot and leaving the 10 milliliter syringe attached to the pilot for inflation after it is inserted into the patient. There are many lessons we have learned from aviation, specifically the way pilots perform checklists prior to flight on every flight to ensure the safety and well being of all on the aircraft. EMS providers are no different. We are responsible for the safety and well being of each other and our patients. So we have talked about our equipment that we need. We've talked about how to assemble the equipment. And now it's time for that final checklist. Do we have the appropriately sized endotracheal tube? Has the integrity of the pilot balloon and inflatable cuff been insured? Have we inserted and molded the malleable stylet? Has the blade style and size been selected? Have we secured all necessary equipment, including suction and a backup device? And have we recruited our colleagues to assist us by handing us off equipment so we don't have to take our eyes off the target when we achieve direct visualization of the course? The position in which the patient is placed is situational. This depends on the fact pattern of what is unfolded in the emergency to bring the patient to where they are currently. For example, a patient who has been struck by a vehicle or has fallen from a large height may be positioned on their back and a modified jaw thrust may be used to affect pre-oxygenation or ventilation. Whereas a medical patient may be positioned on their back with a head tilt chin lift to affect those same procedures. A young child may require a towel or a very small blanket underneath their shoulders to affect the sniffing position. Both the provider and the patient need to be in a position so that the provider can affect efficient ventilation and subsequent endotracheal intubation. Providers should not take more than 30 seconds to successfully intubate a patient. One provider should be intubating the patient while another provider has their eyes closely monitoring a stopwatch or the second hand on their watch. They should announce at 10 and 20 seconds, and then again at 30 seconds, when it is then time for the provider who is attempting endotracheal intubation to stop what they're doing and ventilate the patient again. There is an old saying, pride goeth before the fall, and no provider wants to be unsuccessful in an attempt 
to assist in saving somebody's life. However, providers must do the right thing by the patient, and that is 30 seconds or less to intubate, and then stop what you're doing and ventilate. Providers should take great care when introducing the laryngoscope blade into the patient's mouth. The laryngoscope is a left-handed device and should only be held in the provider's left hand. The blade should be inserted slowly into the patient's mouth as the provider opens it with their other hand. Be careful moving past the teeth and the lips and the gums, and be careful not to damage the patient's teeth or the gums or the lips. This could cause unnecessary bleeding, and in the case of a tooth that is knocked out, could actually cause an airway obstruction. Insert the blade inside the right side of the mouth and sweep the tongue to the left. As the tongue sweeps to the left, look to the posterior pharynx for landmarks. Where you insert the blade is dependent upon what style blade you use. If you are using a Miller blade, it is inserted over the vollecula. A Macintosh blade has the tip inserted into the vollecula. Once it's inserted in the appropriate spot, gently lift the blade up and forward, elevating the mandible without using the teeth as a fulcrum. Do not rock the blade on the patient's upper lip, teeth, or gums. This is a view of the larynx while utilizing a Miller blade. The blade has been inserted into the mouth. There's a forward and upward pressure exerted. The tongue has been swept to the left side of the mouth. It is important to understand that the channel of the laryngoscope blade is not designed as a track to introduce the endotracheal tube, rather a visualization field so you can see the landmarks in the posterior pharynx from the right side of the mouth, and you can insert that endotracheal tube into the right side of the mouth through the vocal cords into the trachea. The view illustrated in this photograph is the optimal view that you could possibly see. You have two vocal cords and an opening that is prepared to accept an endotracheal tube into the trachea. Your visual field will be largely dependent upon why EMS was summoned in the first place maxillofacial trauma or certain medical conditions may skew that view as you're looking in with a laryngoscope blade and light into the posterior pharynx. The provider should slide the endotracheal tube through the right side of the patient's mouth. The provider should view the endotracheal tube passing through the vocal cords. They should not advance the tube too deeply as the end of the tube may seed in the right main stem bronchi. This would be evident during auscultation of the lung fields on the left and the right, where lung sounds would be diminished significantly or absent on the left and only present on the right. Once you have inserted the endotracheal tube, remove the endotracheal blade and stylet from the mouth. Inflate the pilot on the cuff with five to 10 milliliters of air. Confirm proper placement of the endotracheal tube. The provider should assess lung sounds at the apices, which should be present in a properly placed tube. There should be no sounds over the epigastric region, which would indicate that the tube has gone into the esophagus and is now filling the abdomen with air. When you are evaluating proper placement by capnography and waveform capnography, you should utilize devices that provide that waveform capnography. The device picture on the left is a colorometric device, and although it does have use in medicine, that paper will change color when end tidal CO2 is introduced to the paper after six or eight ventilations. However, that paper will not change color back if the tube becomes dislodged. Coaximetry and waveform capnography is the gold standard. And once you have asserted that the tube is in place by auscultation lung sounds and lack of 
any sounds in the epigastrum, you'll be watching the waveform capnography to determine second by second and breath by breath indications that that tube is in the proper place and remains there. It is important to stress that coaximetry in the form of capnometry and waveform capnography is the gold standard for confirmation of endotracheal intubation confirmation. Capnometry with waveform capnography surveillance is required by ALS professionals for all patients who are intubated or have a biad in place. Once confirmation of placement has taken place, the tube should be secured with either a commercial device, oxygen tubing, or endotracheal tubing tape. Monitoring patients who are intubated with waveform capnography is paramount. Once you see a signal that there is an issue with that endotracheal tube, you need to act immediately. First, you can check the devices. Sometimes the inline devices will clog with vomit or blood from the airway. That is a very small receiving port that uh, receives the air that is expelled, and that can become clogged. Second, you can check the pellet balloon on the endotracheal intubation cuff, make sure that is still inflated. You can auscultate lung fields. There should be air coming in through the apices of both of the lungs and no sound in the epigastric region. If you have direct laryngostomy through a visual assistive device, you can insert that and look inside of the posterior pharynx and you may be able to see the tube actually between the vocal cords entering into the trachea. You could insert the bougie tube and determine if you can feel the cartilaginous rings of the trachea past the tube. All of these troubleshooting methods need to be done extremely quickly. You can recheck end title by changing the device uh, even if you put on a color metric momentarily to see if you're getting good gas exchange, there could be a faulty device or the tubing could have been cut. Uh, double check the tube. You can actually insert a bougie into the tube and pull the tube if you believe that you have a faulty tube with a faulty cuff or the tube is clogged with foreign body, food, or blood. If you have to pull the tube, then pull the tube and you can insert a blindly inserted airway device or you can go to a BLS airway to make sure that the patient is getting ventilated properly. It is imperative that all EMS providers properly document all successful and unsuccessful endotracheal intubation attempts in the PCR in the appropriate portion of the PCR. This should include the endotracheal tube sizes, number of attempts, plus or minus success, tube depth, notated at the lip line, presence of bilateral breath sounds, the absence of apogastric sounds, the presence of entitled CO2 by waveform and quantitative capnography. This is done after six breaths, minimum. Service may have a physician sign a form or the PCR, indicating the endotracheal tube was in the proper anatomical position upon arrival at the emergency department. This concludes our presentation on endotracheal intubation. Providers should always consult their local protocols or medical direction with specific questions pertaining to this skill.